Welcome everyone. It's my pleasure to welcome you to our, our final presentation today. And I'm so excited to have been here most of the day and the amazing learning I've had. Um, just, I wish every day was like this, to be quite honest. It's just such a great format to learn. And uh, so if you're, if you're just coming on, I don't, I think everyone's been here before. So I'll just go through um, just some formalities is to welcome from the Jacobs Institute and for innovation in education and also from the San Diego County Office of Ed who is co-sponsoring this event and just I'm inspired to be here and I'm grateful to have been here all day and my name is Dr. Aaron English I work for the San Diego County Office of Education and as the executive director of innovation for about one more day maybe 12 hours something like that and then I'll go do something else I don't know what <laughs> so yeah, I'm just happy to be here, but I'm more happy to be in, um, introducing Perla My Dr. Perla Myers, who will be speaking to us about mathematic mathematics, power, and joy through paper play and pondering. And I'm so excited. I can't think of a better way to end this conference. And uh, so I'm going to read a little bit about uh, Dr. Perla Myers, and then we'll start. And she, what she says is, what is your initial feeling, your reaction when you hear the word mathematics? And I'm not going to tell you mine, but I, I went like that. <laughs> I think I think it should evoke, evoke joy and a smile. Now it does. Yet for too many, it triggers fear and self-image of incompetence. We need diverse approaches and avenues as entryways to the enrichment, satisfaction, and self-efficacy that mathematical curiosity, exploration, and productive struggle can produce. Paper play is one such path, eliciting questions that lead to self-inspired mathematical investigations and abstract results, which in turn can be applied back to the paper itself, resulting in new artistic inventions, which begin the cycle again. Dr. Perla Myers is a professor of mathematics and director of the K-12 Community Engagement for College of Arts and Sciences at the University of San Diego, USD, where she has been on the faculty since 1999. She earned her BS in mathematics from the University of Houston and her MA and PhD in mathematics from the University of California, San Diego. Dr. Myers is passionate about achieving equity in education and diversifying the science, technology, engineering, and mathematics STEM fields, and feels that one step towards these goals is changing the reaction people have when they hear the word mathematics to a smile. And with that, Perla, I'd like to turn it over to you. Thank you so much. Congratulations on your retirement. And thank you very much for the opportunity to have this conversation. I um, would like to share uh, a little bit, and then I, um, I would love to hear your, your thoughts and um, have conversations. So first I'd love to um, start by showing you uh, lots of pictures because I love <laughs> looking at these awesome uh, people. And, um, and I, I guess something that's really uh, uh, wonderful about the work I enjoy doing is that I do it with collaborators, my co-conspirators. And so I love uh, co-conspiring and, and um, working with people to create um, to create experiences. So uh, first, like, I mean, we, we are all too familiar with the reaction people do have towards uh, mathematics when they hear the word. So my students did this little experiment where they uh, asked people at, at University of San Diego and also at Balboa Park. We just stood there for a little bit and hear some of the reactions. If I can get it to work. So how do you feel about math? I hate math. <laughs> Nervous. Uh, misery. Um, it's hard. <laughs> it, yeah, it's hard. Paralyzed. Intimidation. A terror and uh, uneasiness. I suck at that. I, I have to say not everyone felt that way, but it was really very sad that a, a majority of the people do. So, and um, in fact, um, I find that everywhere I go, as soon as I share that I'm a math uh, professor, people start um, sort of um, sharing, oh no, I was terrible at math or, or something like that. And um, as was said in, in previous sessions, there is kind of a, an, um, 
just an assumption that if you do mathematics or if you do any of the STEM fields that you are somehow <laughs> way uh, smarter in some way than, than other people. And I don't find it to be that way. In fact, some of the easier problems to solve are the math problems we get to do in our classes. <laughs> and in fact, the humanities issues that we deal with are the hardest things that we get to solve. Um, so what ends up happening is we have this terror, uneasiness, misery, it starts probably with not getting things as quickly as we intended to get them. And there is a, an, an unspoken feeling that if you are slow at mathematics, then you're bad at it. And if you get things wrong, then you're bad at it, that you need to, to sort of get things right to begin with, or that you need to know um, information that nobody actually ever told you. So for example, mathematical definitions. Nobody tells you the definition, but somehow you need to know exactly which numbers are prime, which ones are not prime, and which is a trapezoid and which one is not a trapezoid, when in fact the definitions change depending on who is working with them. So the bad performance goes into a little cycle. You give up, you don't try, and therefore you have all these horrible feelings. So. Uh, this is how it should be. You have stimulating, cap uh, feel stimulated, <clears throat> capable, successful. You get challenged and accomplished and engaged. Uh, you feel satisfaction that leads to good performance. Sometimes, sometimes you mess it up, but knowing that you need productive struggles. So I do not think that saying it's hard is a bad thing. I think what needs to happen is we need to know that yes, it is hard. Everything that's sort of worthwhile is hard and, and it takes effort. And so what you need to know is that the, the difficulty is something we can uh, overcome. And so um, engaging in productive struggle is something that we uh, help our students uh, and, our, and the kids that, that we engage with uh, to, to to feel and also the, the teachers. So there is, I mean, mathematical achievement of students in the United States is <clears throat> according to the National Assessment of Educational Progress uh, from 2016, you can, 17, you can see the, um, the data here. It's, it's not, not great. Uh, 12th graders, 25% are at or above proficient, proficient level. Uh, and there are considerable gaps that are about 15% in variation uh, between white and African-American students, white and Hispanic students, and then low-income and non-low-income uh, students. And it, it is just not, not okay. So uh, what happens is mathematics performance, according to this uh, Program for International Study assessment, is yes, the United States is sort of um, towards the left of the uh, performance from the other countries. But if you actually look at the data from, the, uh, from PISA and some of the, uh, the studies that have been done, it, uh, this was 34 countries and it was very clear that there was a pretty uh, uh, a correlation between mathematics, well, uh, they're negatively correlated mathematical anxiety and mathematical performance in all of these countries. So for th this, was, this was done for uh, 15 to 16 year olds. Many people worry that mathematics classes will be difficult for them, which again, I don't think it's a bad thing. I think it's okay as long as you know difficulty doesn't mean that you are not capable. Right, so, and then they get very tense in mathematics homework. Some students get very nervous doing math uh, problems, but it's like over 90% of people in the United States have some sort of mathematical anxiety. So this is uh, not the solution, but this is just one attempt. It doesn't have to be paper. There are many different ways. And this is, uh, I'd love to just, um, have a conversation about some of the things we have done, share with you some of the things we have done with paper folding 
to explore the possibilities that it can provide. Uh, there are a lot of advantages to paper. One of them is cheap <laughs> and it's very accessible. It's all around us. We have um, garbage in the form of paper everywhere and it can be used to fold all kinds of, um, so we have access, it's accessible. It is incredibly flexible. And there are so many ways that it can be, uh, that you can play with it. So um, I'll, I'll start by sharing a teeny bit about the kinds of things we have done. And when I say we is really my colleagues and I, and I, I uh, love exploring with my colleagues. When I got really excited about paper folding, uh, when my fifth grader came home one day uh, from having gone to the Minge Museum uh, where they saw an exhibit by Robert Lang. I have later some slides uh, of Robert Lang and, and I'll show you why. You'll see why I was so excited. And so um, I got excited by that. And then I went to a conference in Singapore, which was the um, um, about paper folding uh, origami in science, mathematics, education, engineering. And so there were people from all over the world using paper folding for, and, and other forms of uh, folding to create amazing things. Uh, and so I'll show you a, a couple of those uh, in a little bit. Um, so I came back and started chatting with one of my alumni, Selena Gonzalez, who's up at the top left. And we decided to create Mathigami. Uh, so basically it's uh, paper <laughs> and it was about exploring mathematics through paper folding. And so we started that in 2013 in a few of the after school programs. Then we went into some of the uh, actual schools. And so it was working with future teachers and college students who would go and teach uh, kids how to do it. And so we were playing with this, ex exploring. Then in 2015, my colleagues Odesma Dalrymple and Joyce Spencer, um, uh, we got together and decided to create a STEAM Academy. And my colleague Joyce spoke about uh, the STEAM Academy and, and, and the, the work that, um, really great work that she, um, she has been doing and, and um, our opportunity to collaborate. And so we, we've been doing that since 2015. And then in 2017, the National Science Foundation gave us a, or awarded us a grant to do sort of the STEAM Academy with some paper folding and the world of work, which Ed Hidalgo uh, spoke about earlier. Um, and then um, in 2019, it was um, a project where we worked with fourth graders to explore the possibilities of visual spatial thinking, of enhancing visual spatial thinking through paper folding. And that was uh, with uh, the people you see above, uh, Yaran Lee, Vitaly Popov, um, Dave Geary, uh, Cassie um, uh, Graves, and Taryn Robertson, and Lisa Richley. And um, it's, it's been really great. That, that is that project is still going, but there are some wonderful initial results that show that enhancing the visual spatial skills do transfer into mathematical achievement. And this was work that hadn't been um, done very deeply in the past. So we are about to uh, share some of those, some of all, all of um, these results. Uh, we just got awarded uh, another um, another grant that we will, um, where we will explore creating an online learning environment for his, uh, that has a theme of uh, Latinx um, uh, city uh, with um, Hispanic um, scientists who will come and will play with the kids or will we'll, uh, have conversations with the kids and their families. And we're very excited about that, but that doesn't start till July. So uh, just a teeny bit about, uh, about those. So the goal, I think of the paper is to sort of get people excited, uh, curious, 
exploring, wanting to create, and coming up with their own questions. So the, the explorations are authentic. So it's something where they would um, get engaged, and then they might ask some of their own questions, which will lead to some uh, exploration with the paper. And then from the exploration, the learning comes. Um, and and uh, from the exploration, what ends up happening is there is some art that, that results from it. And so I will give you a couple examples. Uh, so we want it to be an authentic exploration where people can come as themselves with their, with their excitement, what, what, what makes them happy, and um, do an exploration that, that they want to, <laughs> to do. And then give them the opportunity to see and, and naming productive struggle as something that they want to engage in to help build neural connections. So uh, letting them know a little bit about how the brain works and how even when they make mistakes, they are creating the neural connections. And, and so for them to respond to hard work and failure, not with, oh my gosh, I'm too dumb, I, I can't do it, I'm not a math person or I'm not this kind of person, to uh, really saying, oh, I guess, here, I, I'm going to, to engage in this productive struggle. And then, of course, the joy that I have uh, been to most of the sessions today. And one theme that really seemed to go from one session to another was that uh, theme of joy, of uh, infusing the learning uh, experiences with joy. And so I, um, I, we love to have these opportunities for laughter. And then hopefully at the end of all of this, you hear the word math, if we can somehow create the connection between the math and the paper folding, which we're, we're working on, um, then there will be opportunities for entry for kids who sometimes don't see themselves as math people. And it turns out that some of the kids who do really well with the paper folding and the explorations are the, are the kids who, who are not the math people or the ones that have been named that. And this gives them an entry into being the experts. And so they, they start developing some um, confidence. So what, what I wanna do is I wanna share with you a couple examples of some crazy explorations with my students that my students and I did and, and get your thoughts. Um, so here are a couple examples. I'm gonna start with this one. This happened to uh, appear on my desk one day. <laughs> so a colleague saw it somewhere and she remembered that I liked uh, uh, the paper folding. And so she, uh, it appeared on my desk. I didn't know where it came from. I eventually found out and I had never seen anything so cool. <laughs> so basically it's, uh, it's created out of a, a whole bunch of modules, a lot of them. And um, it sat there for a while. And one day when my daughter was visiting, uh, I thought uh, she, she started, she took one of the little modules off and we started to, to look at it. And we realized, oh, it's about the size and the shape of a, an index card. So I went to my drawer and I found, you know, 181 index cards. And I thought, oh, okay, they're not, I don't think it's quite the right number, but then I played with them for a while created the little modules and eventually created this, you know, little swan. And I was, you know, pretty happy with it once I uh, destroyed it and put it back together and destroyed it and put it back together. And, and you know, it took, a, it took a little while. And so with my students, we were, we were chatting. And so this is, uh, uh, these are a couple of my students, Ashley and Payne. And we said, Let, let's explore what happens if we use one, like they cut the card into four parts and we use each one of those pieces as one of the modules to create one of the modules, but we still use the 181 little modules to create the, um, this one. And so the question is, if we do that, then how, how tall will the, with the new, will the new swan be? So same number of modules, same uh, or like the, we put them together exactly in the same way. So any thoughts about that? How many modules? Uh, I mean, if we use the same number of modules, how tall do you think that will turn out to be?
Any thoughts? If you if you want to put it into the in the chat or not, how tall do you think it will be? So it seems like one to four, right? Uh, so the, yeah, that that was our initial our initial our like initial thought, and then we thought, hold on a minute, and I just tricked you, right? Because I said it's a car that is one quarter as large as the original one, so I just took you a direction that I sort of told you what the answer should be, but really the truth is. If we think about it a little bit, and of course you don't know what this looks like, so it's hard to know what the module will be, but the heights turn out to be about the same. What happens if I had instead asked, what if we use a car that is one half as long and one half as wide, right? Because it's not about area, we're looking for the height, so it should be somehow associated with length. And really this new card is one half as tall and one half as wide. So my students and I were convinced, okay, it's gonna be one half as tall, right? Do you agree or do you disagree? We're gonna make the same folds. We're gonna put them together the same way. We're, it's gonna be one half as tall, agree or not? Yes, no? Well, I mean, I'm telling you, I, we were convinced. I didn't say we knew, right? <laughs> so we were, ex we, we knew this was going to be it. So it is a trick question. So is it going to be one half as tall? So the scaling factor, it, yeah, it, it looks that way, right? One half this way, one half that way. So we put them together. We created the little one and we said, okay, it's gonna be one half as tall. And then we looked at it and we're like, uh, no. There's something just, no, look, if I put another one there, it's really not one half as tall. And so it really baffled us. We're like, oh my God, like, what do you mean? We did one half each way. Like, why is it not working? And I have to say, it took us a very long time to realize that what we did is we We had a car that was one half as tall, one half as wide, but it didn't occur to us that the card actually has a third dimension, right? <laughs> the thickness of the card. <laughs> and so we did not change the thickness of the card and therefore our swan ended up a lot taller because the way the pieces came together, it had that thickness. So, like real mathematics is it, or the mathematics we think we do on paper, it doesn't always apply exactly uh, how we imagine to real life, right? So there are a lot of lessons to sort of learn in the exploration, okay? And, and again, this was like <laughs> kind of crazy, right? And so we went and found some paper that made us think like, we don't know how to measure, we don't have the caliper to measure the thickness, but we were happy with saying that it was one half as thick because the swan that we created was one half as, <laughs> as tall. And then we, you know, we asked more questions. What happens with other dimensions? What if instead of a three and a half or a three by five card, we use a four inch by six inch card, and then we can see what happens in the, in the result. And then we play a little bit more. What happens, what happens with bigger paper, right? So we can create bigger paper with much larger paper. There is, you know, we started to create other kind of cool things. And then we thought, what about, what other things can we make? And I happen to like penguins. So I put together a bunch of these and it took me a very long time. But I guess that the, what we're doing is, and what we were doing is asking really simple questions. And in mathematics, one thing we do is we create something and then we say, oh, how can we vary this thing? What are some ways in which, in which we can vary the variables of our whatever thing it is, right? So we create this penguin, can we change the color of the paper? Can we change the lengths of the paper? Can we change the heights? Can we change the thickness? Can we change it so it's not paper, it's metal or something else? And in math, we do those things. We start with a concrete situation, we take it to the abstract world, and then in the abstract world, we sort of play around with it. 
and we, we take it away from the real life thing. So we change numbers, we change um, uh, some of the lengths. So all the, those are numbers, we change materials, we change different things, play with that. And then we try to apply it back to the real world. So that is something we do in mathematics and it's a mathematical uh, thinking um, uh, uh, skill. So we thought, well, I, I showed this one to my dad and he said, where are the feet? And I said, uh, no, there's no feet. It's a, you know, it's an abstract figure. It's an abstract thing when he said, no, it needs feet. And, and I said, no, there, there are no feet. But what's really wonderful is one, uh, we were having a little workshop and one of the teachers in the workshop said, hey, what happens if we keep the same width and change the length of the piece of paper that we use to create the shapes? And so what we did is we created all the different penguins that we could using the different lengths. So if you look at the back of the penguin right here, you can sort of see this is the size of the paper or these are the dimensions of the paper and this is what we got. As the paper got a little bit longer, you can sort of see that it starts getting a little spikier and then a little bit longer, it starts getting a little spikier and a little spikier and a little spikier. And then at some point it turns out that because it, the paper's so long, when you do the folds and you create the little modules, there's a little bit of extra paper that stays out. So you can do all kinds of things with that paper, fold it in other ways. So that's how you can create little feet or little tails or the little beak or, or something like that, right? So. Again, it's you start with some very basic, this is a very basic idea, math question. What happens if you change the length, right? And then you get to create new art by asking this question that takes you to the abstract and then you try it back in the concrete. So here, here's the little penguin. If you look back at the, uh, the initial uh, swan and the, the, the one on the right is one that was created when we use the ones with the longer piece of paper, we, we have this extra paper to play with to create pretty um, pretty ends. So it, it, it was just kind of fun. Let me show you. So these are other ones. You can you can use the extra paper also to create little fuzzies and you know make your king king penguins or your macaroni penguin or whatever you want, or you can make big ones. These are wonderful uh, students making bigger <laughs> versions of the penguin. So we're playing and having fun. Here's another example. And I'm gonna go through this one just so you see, you get an idea that we can do this at different levels. This is a little pocket that my son created. And basically the bottom of it is pretty much when you create it, this is from an eight and a half by 11 piece of paper. You do a whole bunch of things to it uh, and it doesn't matter specifically what they are, but this is a crease pattern and this is what the crease pattern looks like. And when you're done with it after the 12, and actually it's more steps because you do the same thing on, the, on one side and then on the other. After you're done with that, you end up with this little um, pocket that is pretty much flat. So, we said, hey, what if you do it with a paper of a different size? How about an, an 11 by 17? And we did that and we created one that had sort of volume, like a lot of volume. The other one was like a little envelope, very flat. This one like sticks out. I look at it over here, the bottom looks like that. And then you can start asking questions. So for example, is the bottom a square? I like have. I mean, it sort of looks like one, but you know, is it? is it? Is it not a square? And if it's not a square, could we start, what size of paper would we start with so that we end up with a square on the bottom, right? We, what, would, what would we have to have to begin with? So there's, these are kind of fun questions that we wanted to explore, but somebody else might wanna play with something completely different, right? So we did a little bit of, you know, uh, of algebra, I, it's not very pretty. Uh, I probably uh, 
could have done it a little neater <laughs> to keep track a little better. But basically, we ended up seeing, oh, no, it's not a square. But once we had done the, the little uh, exploration, we knew exactly what kind of paper we would need to create a square if we wanted to. Right. And so we could then go try it and say, oh, my goodness, this is really a square. Then you can do other things. So, for example, remember the other pieces of paper were sort of horizontally oriented. This one is vertically oriented, right? So more up and down. Um, and so what happens then? And, and this is where you can say, OK, you are going to have to create some new rules to your process because the way the process is doesn't exactly work. And so this is an opportunity to innovate, to say, OK, if the process doesn't work, what would my brain want me to do to like adjust so it makes sense for this new orientation of the piece of paper? And I think what's really kind of cool is that you end up with something completely different that you would never have created had you not gone sort of the like let's explore something a little bit different that we wouldn't have thought about um, before, right? So this is kind of, I, I think it's so pretty and uh, you can sort of see this one's the 11 by 17 and you, cr you create this you know, little container. <laughs> Whereas the other one, if you just rotate the paper and follow the same instructions, making adjustments as needed, then you end up with this one. And I'm not sure why it moved over to the left. <laughs> so who innovates with paper? I guess let, let me let me stop for one second. What what do you think about all these things? Uh, any thoughts about it? What um, have you tried any of these sorts of things with paper before? And please, uh, Priscilla, if, if anybody would like to unmute, I love to hear and see people if they, they would like to to share some things. I know I've... Uh... This was wonderful. Oh, I, I've never seen anything like this before. So, so it's just kind of a, a little bit different uh, than, than maybe what what we've seen. So they, we see, I see amazing possibilities uh, with this. And I guess I'd like to just spend a couple minutes showing you some things that people innovate with paper. So the, this is Eric and Marty. The they are at MIT. And these, basically, they're glass blowers and artists and computer scientists and mathematicians and all kinds of things. But they collaborate with people all over the world and they do this sort of thinking, sort of start with something and then they go, okay, let's take it to the abstract, play with it there, and then try to apply it back to the concrete. And so these are some of the things they create. Uh, Sifo Mabona is a Swiss origami master and he created this, uh, he did a Kickstarter uh, where, he <laughs> where he got money to create this thing. He uses these, um, his art to advocate for caring for the environment, right? So um, there are lots, lots of ways that paper folding can, uh, can get you doing some things that um, are really important to every learner uh, who wants to uh, sort of explore. And so there's an entry point and an interest that can maybe engage somebody to think about some of the mathematics that comes with it. Um, this is uh, Miri Golan. She teaches, uh, they, in Israel, they teach uh, origami to kindergartners, to every, every kid. It's called origametria. And she believes that um, Arabs and, and like Palestinian and Jewish children should be together. So she has a Quran and a Bible and the people are coming together, uh, coming out of it. Um, this is Vincent Florer. Basically, he and a whole bunch of other people just squash paper and create things. It's like, it's like paper crumpling. Uh, Robert Lang is the one that I shared um, with you in the beginning. He's the one that really inspired my son and got me excited. And so all of these things, except for this one, are made with one piece of paper. And 
he created a computer program that spits out a folding pattern for you to, um, to use to create any shape you want using mathematical principles. So theorems that people, he, he says, uh, dead people found these things and now we're using their, uh, their, their brilliance to create these math, uh, math engaged programming uh, capab capabilities. Uh, she creates uh, bags in Japan, people were going, <laughs> uh, following her around. Uh, Eric Shua said, I think his pieces uh, almost look like they are alive, I think. Uh, Amy Lee went to learn, um, she was from New York and went to Korea to learn the art of hanji uh, uh, creation, paper creation out of the hanji tree. And they told her she couldn't because she's a woman. Uh, and then somebody took her own and uh, on and taught her and now she's a, she's a master teaching uh, hanji uh, art. And then of course, Saul Moreno Hernandez in Mexico uses paper or used uh, paper. Mademoiselle Maurice is a street artist and she goes all over the world and creates huge installations um, that are very political and um, act it, she's an activist and, and does amazing work. Pedro Linares Lopez uh, in Mexico. This is the uh, alebrijes that you saw in Coco. <laughs> so you can uh, sort of see, basically anybody can do this, like play with paper in some, some way. So there is so much possibility. This is, um, this uh, Janine Mosley creates 60, like with 66,000 business cards, she creates these things with the community. So it's a community endeavor and they all come together and put together these incredible constructions. So uh, of course, uh, Mexico in Mexico, there are all kinds of things we make, uh, people make from uh, paper. Um, some applications um, that are real life applications, um, sending a satellite to space. If you want to send something a long way and it's huge, it's harder to send than if it's a little thing. So if you're gonna send something to space, you wanna make it as small as possible, take it to space and then origami allows it to unfold in some way. So sending um, uh, solar powered, uh, powered in, powering objects or satellites to space is, is really useful to have paper, uh, some sort of folding inspired things. So you can do, folding and, and move things around with all kinds of, in, in all kinds of ways. And so what if we do not have paper and we have other materials? You can mimic the paper by using um, like hinges, for example, in which case you can make anything uh, follow a paper folding technique. And, and so there have been all kinds of creations. So, and right now, Face masks are pretty uh, um, important. Also collapsible shield uh, uh, cans to stop bullets, unfortunately uh, relevant at this, at this time, but there are all kinds of ways that we can use folding to create um, solutions. So here's another one. If you want to transport a bunch of pasta, you don't want it to be in three dimensions as, or you want it to be as flat as possible. So here's one way you give it to them flat, but then it turns into a little, uh, you know, popped up pasta thing. Uh, kayaks, they don't take up a lot of space if they're flat. A plant changes as it grows, so it unfolds as needed. Um, uh, shelter, there are shelters made from the cardboard. There are applications in medicine. So here you can, rather than do uh, open heart surgery, you can insert the stent over in the leg. You fold it a little bit like uh, with, you know, inspired by paper folding, insert a little balloon, take it through with uh, you know, some sort of a, um, a catheter or something like that. When it gets to the right place, you unfold it. And then uh, that's it. There it is in, in its place without doing a major surgery. For this one, they, they were doing some experiments where they would take DNA and teach it to fold itself into little boxes. So when they do chemotherapy, 
what ends up happening, the good cells die as much as the, as the cancerous cells. So what, what they can do is code the DNA to identify the cancerous cells. And so they put it into the little box, allow the, the little boxes to go into the body and they identify the cancer cells, kill only those. So there are some really amazing techniques that, um, that can be done with uh, paper folding um, inspired things. And I just wanted to give you a little idea of where this could go. And I'd love, I know I only left four minutes <laughs> to, to kind of have conversation, but I just think there's so much possibility for this to, to engage and inspire and give entryway to people at all different levels and, and to give them some joy. And I always love this quote from Maya Angelou that I'm, um, I'll end with. Um, and it is basically, if we send our kids into a classroom and they feel stressed and anxious and upset and, and incapable and just hurt in some way, that, that's what they'll remember the next time they see, um, they hear about mathematics and it's next time they hear about, you know, anything else really that they were dealing with at that point. So if we can just figure out ways to like give them joy and have them smile um, during the time that they're learning mathematics and <laughs> anything else, then maybe uh, when they hear that word in the future, that is what they will innately do. So thank you. <laughs> Dr. Myers, that was beautiful, wonderful, outstanding. I, I'm going to give her a round of applause for anyone who's muted. But thank you. Uh, what an amazing way to, to uh, stop our day. And um, the thing is, you did change my opinion. Remember when you said in the beginning, I was like, oh. <laughs> but now I have a different schema in my head, so I'll be able to think of that rather than the the ruler hitting my hand when I was in fourth grade. Oh so, no. <laughs> No, that's fascinating. I've never seen anything like that before. Thank you very much. I, I, uh, I'm very excited by the possibilities there. And I'd love to know if anybody has had any experience with this, any ideas that, that popped up that you want to collaborate on. I'm, I'm excited to, uh, to collaborate on this and, and, and do some great things. I will keep that in mind. <laughs> well, thank you everyone. And again, I'm not gonna cut anyone else. So if you do have questions, put them in the chat or just ask them, speak out loud. But I just wanna say thank you, Dr. Myers and uh, Jacobs Institute. What an amazing, wonderful day and what a, the, a fantastic way to end our day. So I, I, you know, you know, we've been, uh, we've been going, I think uh, Priscilla has been going for months, but today we've been going since about eight, seven o'clock this morning. And to end on such a happy high note is just phenomenal. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you.